How many of you have a favorite character, favorite person from the Bible? Besides Jesus, and everybody's got their hands raised, so they're going to say Jesus. Besides Jesus, somebody that you look at as a model, somebody who you, you just, you're moved when you read about their ministry or the things that they did. All of us probably have somebody like that. I'm a young guy in ministry, so I'm a little bit partial to guys like Timothy and Titus. Uh, but I love many of the Old Testament heroes as well, Daniel being one of them, King David. Um, there's, there's a long list of them. But one of the things we find <clears throat> is that as we look at the heroes of the Christian faith, we find that most of them really weren't that great. They're not as great as we kind of hold them up to be. Take Moses, for example. He was a great man, a godly man. He led the Israelites out of Egypt. He led them through the wilderness and to the promised land. He spoke with God. He didn't enter the promised land, though, did he? He didn't, because he was disobedient to the Lord. Despite having seen all of these things, he was disobedient. King David is one that many of us admire. King David probably wouldn't pass a background check for a church trying to hire a pastor. Right? We all know of King David. He was a foretaste of a much greater king to come. And he had his successes and he was faithful for much of his life. But all of us know of his sin with Bathsheba and his murder to cover it up. The apostle Peter, the leader of the 12 disciples, the one that Jesus said, I will build my church on this rock. But Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter needed to be rebuked by the apostle Paul because Peter separated himself from and mistreated the Gentile Christians. Throughout the Bible, we find that, that even the most faithful men had significant shortcomings and serious lapses into sin. But when we look at the life of Daniel, we don't find such failures. And that's not to say Daniel was sinless or that he was perfect. He certainly was not perfect. He certainly was, sin was a sinner just like us. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But throughout God's word, we only find positive things. And he is held up outside of the book of Daniel as well as, as one of the most faithful men. Daniel endured some of the most difficult circumstances imaginable. He, he endured some of the most dreadful temptation that any of us could possibly face, but he was uncompromising and steadfast in his faith. I think all of us would probably say we'd be better off if our faith resembled that of Daniel just a little bit more. Christians today are living in exile just as Daniel was. But all too often we see that the faith of Christians wavers. And it's driven by conceding to the whims and the ideology of a sinful culture. And you may struggle with that even today. right? You desire to be faithful to Jesus on the one hand. But on the other hand, you also want to be loved and accepted by the world and the culture. But the problem is, is that those two desires always move in different directions. You cannot do both of those things. As followers of Jesus, we must have steadfast faith in every circumstance. So how do we do that? How do we have unwavering faith today as we are Christians living in exile, waiting for the return of our king? Daniel 6 provides a helpful model for us, a model of steadfast faith that I think is worthy of imitating for each one of us. Open your Bibles with me. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 6 today, verses 1 through 28, but we'll begin here just by reading verses 1 through 9. You can follow along on the screen, or you can turn there in your Bibles with me. <clears throat> it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. 
Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was found in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error, no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction, that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So Daniel 6 <clears throat> picks up right where we left off in Daniel 5. The seat of human authority has shifted. The mighty Babylon has fallen, and the Medes and the Persians have risen to take its place. And now you have a man named Darius reigning on the throne. And King Darius provides almost an identical problem to the one posed by King Belshazzar in chapter 5. And what I mean by that is that there is no mention of him outside of the Bible. Our historical records point to a man named Cyrus the Persian as the first king of the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, until Christ returns or new historical data is found, we can't be entirely sure, but there are several plausible solutions to resolve this issue. Some people believe that Darius was simply another name for the son of King Cyrus, and so he kind of served in his father's place within the city of Babylon. Others would say the same thing uh, about another man, the, the general of King Cyrus, and after he took the city, King Cyrus rewarded him by letting him rule that city. My personal opinion is that Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian are the same person. It's well attested throughout history that a king would adopt different titles that would be used by the different peoples that he ruled over. And we know that Cyrus had both Persian and Median lineage. And so Darius then would be the Median name used by his Median subjects, while Cyrus would be his Persian name used by his Persian subjects. And we're going to see both of these names throughout the rest of the, throughout the, rest of the book of Daniel. But know that as we move through the rest of the book, I understand, and we'll, we'll preach accordingly, that these men are one and the same. So Darius, he begins to place his own men into leadership, and he establishes these 120 satraps, and then he sets three other officials over them to oversee their work. The primary purpose of a satrap was to collect what belonged to the king. They would go to the different cities and, and districts, and they would get the tax money, the, the tribute, anything that the king was due, they would make sure it was collected and then delivered to the king. So Daniel and the other two high officials, they were placed over them to oversee that process, make sure the king was receiving all that he was actually supposed to receive, that everything was getting from the satraps to the king's treasury. <clears throat> so it's interesting here because not only was Daniel spared when the Persians invaded into Babylon and slaughtered the, the lords and the, the important people that we saw last week, but he was also immediately placed into a position of leadership. He seemed to have been well-known among the Jewish people of his day, so it's possible that the stories of Daniel's success, of his wisdom, of his interpretations, that may have spread to Persia as well. Or it could be that God simply gave Daniel favor in the eyes of the Persians, like he did when he was first taken in to Babylon. But either way, Daniel is now in the service of King Darius, and just like he was when he was in Babylon, or under the, the, the rule of Babylon, Daniel excels far above every other servant of the king. So much so that the king decided he was going to set Daniel over his entire kingdom. Now, this is all taking place one year after, within one year after the fall of Babylon. So Dan Daniel has made an impressive amount of progress here in the eyes of the king. 
And in similar fashion to what we saw in chapter 3, the success of God's servant provokes jealousy and anger, anger from the king's servants. And the text doesn't tell us exactly why that is, why these other servants wanted to get rid of Daniel, but I think it gives us a hint in verse 2. Because Daniel takes the time to mention that his job was to make sure the king suffered no loss. He was supposed to make sure everything was getting from point A to point B. He was making sure the king did not lose out on anything that was rightly his. So my opinion then is that these other officials, they wanted to skim a little off the top. They were the ones collecting the money, and it's a lot of money. The king's not going to miss a few coins here or there, and they wanted to take a little bit for themselves. But because Daniel was diligent and he did his work well, they were unable to do this without getting caught. And so they wanted Daniel out of the way so they could be free to take as they pleased from the king. And they conspired together. They, they looked to find fault in Daniel. But the problem was is that Daniel never set a foot wrong. They could find no error or fault in him. And those words could be translated as negligence and corruption. So there was no carelessness in Daniel's work, and there was no corruption. He was not going to intentionally be dishonest. He was not going to intentionally take what was not his. Daniel did his work with diligence and integrity. He was faithful. He was excellent in his service to the king. And these officials agreed that the only way we're going to catch Daniel out, the only way we're going to get him in, we're going to get rid of him, is to leverage his faith against him. Because these men knew that Daniel's allegiance to his God was greater than his allegiance to the king. If Daniel was to be undone, it would have to be on the grounds of his faith. Daniel's steadfast faith was demonstrated through a life of personal holiness and obedience to his God. And that steadfast faith is what caused these other men to hate him. Daniel's faith was not hidden from the Persians or the people around him. These men knew the depths of Daniel's faith because his faith produced an excellent way of living. So if you and I hope to have steadfast faith just like Daniel, we need to imitate him in this respect. Steadfast faith is demonstrated through holiness and obedience to God. That's number one. When our lives are examined by those outside the church, we should be found excellent in every respect. Daniel was known as faithful and honest and hardworking. He was a good and moral man, but those things were true because of his faith in his God. And the world around us should see the church as the very best when it comes to loving your neighbor, showing kindness and hospitality and compassion, generosity and service. Christians should be the ideal workers and employees, neighbors, friends, family members, husbands, wives, bosses, whatever you want to throw in there. We should be the very best, the most desirable of those things. But those things should be true because of our faith in Jesus, because we are being obedient to him. Nobody questioned why Daniel was the way he was. They didn't question why Daniel was so excellent in all that he did. They didn't question why he had integrity. They knew why. The source of his character was his faith in his God. How many of us hide our faith from the world around us? Do your coworkers know of your faith in Jesus? Do they see the result of your faith in the way that you live and act? Do they recognize the difference in your life because of your faith in Jesus? Is your love for Jesus so clear that it can't help but spilling over into the way that you speak and treat others? Or do you keep your faith hidden so that you can feel a little bit better about not being obedient in the presence of non-Christians? Do you keep it hidden so that you don't stand out in the crowd and you can be treated just like everyone else? Brothers and sisters, hidden faith is not steadfast faith. Steadfast faith is demonstrated openly in our lives in the way that we live. And if you desire to have steadfast faith like Daniel had, you are going to stand out. 
Look at how these men treated Daniel. They acknowledged that by every metric, Daniel was awesome. He was a great guy. He's exactly the person you would want as an employee. But they hated him. And they hated him because of his steadfast faith. Do not let the fear of standing out keep you from obedience to Jesus. When we do stand out, there will be those that hate us. And Jesus told us this in the Gospel of John. They hated me, so they're going to hate my followers. But when the world hates us, it should not be for any sinfulness or unkindness or arrogance of our own. We should be found blameless in the eyes of the world, just like Daniel was. If they hate us, let it only be for the offense of our faith in Jesus. Once these men had determined to use Daniel's faith against him, they came by agreement, which is another way to say they conspired together. And they made a proposal to the king, and they dishonestly tell him that, hey, king, everybody agrees on this. We think this is the best thing for you and your new kingdom. Make this injunction. Now, Daniel certainly did not agree with this, and this was most likely just a small handful of those satraps, so probably not all of the king's counselors like they claim but the two high officials besides Daniel and a small group of satraps. Now, this injunction essentially makes the king the mediator between men and the gods for 30 days. This, this law didn't mean you couldn't ask for a favor from a neighbor. It didn't mean you couldn't go over to your neighbor's house and ask him to borrow a cup of sugar. Not that kind of thing. This is a very religiously and, and politically oriented injunction. The point here was that you don't go to the priests. You don't pray yourselves. If you need to communicate with your God or any gods, you must come to the king and let him do it for you. And if you violate this, you're going to be fed to the lions. So this would be like Joe Biden telling the whole country that for 30 days, you are not allowed to pray. You can't request prayer from anybody else, from your pastor or from a priest. If you want to make a request to God, you have to come and ask Joe Biden, and if you break this law, you're getting sat down in the electric chair. Not a good place to be in for Daniel, right? Now, Darius probably was thinking this more along the lines of just being a helpful way of solidifying his political authority. I don't think he was trying to, to squish out other religions in his kingdom. Persia was pretty tolerant of other religions. But in an effort to solidify his rule, he signs this into law. And once that was done, he could not take it back. Medo-Persian law prevented him from walking back this decree. So now, a trap has been set for Daniel. Let's read the next section and take a look at Daniel's response to this injunction. So chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. <clears throat> when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went up to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees there three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days except to you O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually serve, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and, he, and sleep fled from him. 
So Daniel hears of this new injunction, this new decree, and it doesn't change anything for him. He continues on business as usual. He returns home. He goes upstairs to the window that faces Jerusalem, and he prays there just as he does three times a day. Now, as you read verse 10, you may be wondering, why specifically is Daniel facing toward Jerusalem when he prays? Daniel is actually modeling prayer from God's word here. He is praying in the way that he has read about in God's word. If you uh, can think back to 1 Kings chapter 8, when the temple was built, they had this big ceremony, and Solomon prayed this prayer of dedication over the temple. And in this prayer, we see that Solomon assumed that exile was a possible punishment for the unfaithfulness of the Israelite people. But in this prayer, he asks God to be merciful when those exiles repent. And throughout that whole prayer, Solomon tells the Israelites to pray toward the city of Jerusalem seven times. So one, Daniel is praying in the way that God's word has told him to pray. And two, Daniel is praying for his fellow Israelites. And it's interesting because we don't see him hear of this injunction and they go home and, and start begging for God to spare him from the lion's den. He may have done that. It's not recorded. It wouldn't have been wrong for him to do that. But what is recorded is that Daniel had a habit of interceding for the rest of God's people. We don't need to face Jerusalem when we pray, but we can apply this to our prayer life nonetheless by praying for others, praying according to Scripture just as Daniel did. Intercession, praying for other believers, that should form a large focus of our prayer life. This is what Daniel was praying for three times a day. He got down on his knees and begged for mercy from God, prayed for the repentance of his fellow Israelites so that God could return them back to the land of Israel. Now, it's good that we pray for things that are important to us, issues we face, desires that we have, but that should not be all we pray for. And if you read the prayers of the Bible, Paul the Apostle, for example, in the New Testament, almost all of their prayers are interceding on behalf of other believers. So if you struggle to know what to pray for, pray for others. Read the prayers of the Bible and imitate those. Do what Daniel did and model your prayer on the prayers of the Bible. Now, because these men knew that Daniel would forego worshiping his God, they lied in wait to catch him in the act. And Judy Slaby came up to me before and told me she was reading Daniel 6. And the way she pictured this is that these men were waiting outside Daniel's window with their phones ready so they could record it, make it go viral, send it to the king. Uh, and that's what they're doing, obviously, without the phones. They came and they, they lied in wait waiting to catch Daniel because they knew he comes to this window every day and he kneels down three times and he worships and prays to his God. And so they wait, they watch him, they catch him, and then they go to the king. But they don't immediately report Daniel for breaking this law because they want to make sure the king cannot walk this back. And so they make him reaffirm that this law cannot be revoked. And he does. He doubles down on this. This cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians. Once he does that, they seize their moment and they report Daniel's actions to the king. But the king is not angry. He's actually very worried for Daniel. He's torn up over this. He's heartbroken over this because he loves Daniel. And it says he set his mind to deliver Daniel. He, he devoted all of his energy that whole day to trying to find some kind of loophole that would let Daniel off the hook. But his best efforts ultimately end in failure. And he is forced to follow through and condemn Daniel to the lion's den. Now, some of you might be thinking, that's dumb. He's the king and he can do whatever he pleases. And you're not alone. There are many people who, who challenge the historicity of this chapter on those grounds. They say, well, that's, that's not right. You really could have walked it back if he wanted. But there is one historian, and he records an incident where a later Persian king, Darius III, condemned a man to death. And then Darius III was repentant and remorseful and distressed because after he condemned the man, that man was found to be innocent. But at that point, it was too late because the king had already signed the decree and the injunction, and that man was executed anyway. 
So we have actual historical precedent to believe that the king really was powerless to stop Daniel's sentence here. So the king provides one last encouragement to Daniel, the encouragement that, that potentially maybe your God will save you, Daniel. And then he rolls the stone over the mouth of the den, and the king's seal is placed on it so that no one could tamper with it or set him free. And then the king goes home and has a not very good night. He doesn't eat, he can't distract himself, and he cannot sleep because he is so sick over this situation. Now, before we move on and read of Daniel's fate, I want to look back at the way Daniel prayed because it teaches us something else about steadfast faith. So Daniel prayed three times a day, every day. Now, that doesn't mean we need to pray three times a day, every day, facing Jerusalem. It doesn't mean we have to read our Bibles three times a day. But what it shows us is that steadfast faith is consistent. That's number two. Steadfast faith is consistent. And consistency means that there is a regular routine and practice of our faith. One that is not changed, one that is unfazed by the circumstances going on around us. Daniel wasn't praying in front of an open window as some kind of act of defiance to the king. That was simply the way he worshiped. And if you look back at verse 10, what it says is he went down and he prayed as he had done previously. This was just Daniel's regular practice. He had made a habit of worshiping God in this way three times a day. He would get down, he would thank the Lord, he'd worship, and he would intercede on behalf of God's people. And although Daniel was extremely loyal and faithful to the king, Daniel refused to let anybody, including the king, keep him from worshiping his God. Consistency in our faith means that the hardships we face in life, the social pressures we may experience, the busyness of our lives, they will not keep us from faithfully worshiping and spending time with the Lord. It means that we don't cease to worship God or be obedient to God because the people around us might not like it very much or out of fear they might not like us very much if we continue to be faithful. Now, it would be wrong for us to take Daniel's example and make it a command. There's not a set number of times for how many times a day you need to pray. But if we hope to remain steadfast while living in a sinful culture, it will require consistency from us. And I think most of us, when we read this, we get, we get a little bit hyped up here because it's kind of like the government versus Daniel, the government versus the faithful. And we're like, yeah, I would never listen to the government. Joe Biden can't tell me not to pray. And I believe you. I think that is true. But what about everything else that you allow to keep you from prayer and worship? The things that you allow to keep you from being consistent in your walk with Jesus? Because if you're anything like me, it doesn't take a whole lot to convince us to skip that for a day or for a month or, or weeks or however long. We don't need the government to tell us not to do it because we're just going to choose not to do it anyways. We love to let work or college football take precedent over church or spending time with the Lord. We'll jump at any kind of plans we have that'll get us out of serving on the weekend. So don't read this passage and think only of the king commanding Daniel not to worship. It should cause us to consider what are we allowing to regularly distract us or prevent us from worship? What is keeping our hearts from being fully and completely fixed on Jesus? And again, to be clear, I'm not advocating for some legalistic standard of never missing church and, and doing nothing but prayer and, and reading your Bible. There are legitimate reasons and times where, where we miss those things. But what I do think this passage invites us to consider is whether we are consistent in the practice of our faith and in our obedience to the Lord. Because while we can't regulate frequency of prayer and worship, it is extremely wise and helpful to develop regular habits for worshiping God. I think that was immensely beneficial for Daniel because his habit of praying three times a day, it helped him continue to be consistent. When that, when that pressure from the king came, it was second nature to Daniel. He's just going to continue doing what he already does. And if we can build those similar habits, it will help us to remain consistent when that hardship or pressure comes. So Daniel's steadfast faith is demonstrated through holiness and obedience 
and in his consistency. And what you're gonna see in the section we're about to read is that Daniel refuses to put his faith anywhere other than God himself. Let's read the rest of the passage, verses 19 through 28. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces." Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. <clears throat> when morning arrives, the king hurries off to the lion's den. He's frantic and he runs there as fast as he can to learn of Daniel's fate. And he gets there and he cries out to Daniel, hoping that just maybe he will get a response. And he cries out and asks, has your God delivered you, Daniel? And as it turns out, the king was not the only one who fasted the night before. Those lions were fasting as well. And Daniel calls back and explains that God sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions because Daniel was blameless before God and because Daniel had done no harm to the king. God has vindicated and delivered his servant. Daniel had not sinned before God, and so God delivered him. But like in chapter 3, when we talked about the fiery furnace when God delivered Daniel's friends from the furnace, steadfast faith and obedience to God does not guarantee deliverance from earthly trial. God does promise to deliver and vindicate every one of his people, but that does not promise that the deliverance will come in this life. He may deliver today or tomorrow in the present, but the greater deliverance, the best kind of deliverance will come when Christ returns. Now, our third point is seen most clearly in verse 23. It says that he was taken up out of the den and no harm was found on him because he trusted in his God. Number three, steadfast faith is properly placed. God and God alone was the object of Daniel's faith. Daniel did not trust in King Darius. King Darius loved Daniel. Daniel was his most trusted servant, but at the end of the day, King Darius was helpless to deliver Daniel. As powerful as he was, he was not truly sovereign. He did not hold Daniel's fate in his hand. We read in verse 14 that the king tried absolutely everything he could, but it was not enough. Daniel knew it was not the king who held his life in his hand. And that's why we never see Daniel begging the king to reconsider. We don't see Daniel making a case saying, King, I've been nothing but loyal and faithful to you. This is not fair. You can stop this. Please save me from the lion's den. We never see him panic or worry because Daniel has now been in Babylon, or now Persia, for 60 plus years, living as an exile. And through that time, God never failed him. Daniel has no reason to put his faith anywhere else. The king was not a worthy object of Daniel's faith, and we would do well to remember that. There is no human 
ruler that deserves your trust or faith, church. Even the politicians that you love, the ones that you think are respectful, the ones that you think are great, and they're pushing the policies you like, and you agree with them on all of the issues, they don't have the power to fix your life. They don't have the power to forgive sins or extend your life by a single second. The authority and power of man makes a lousy object for our faith. Those with steadfast faith do not trust in princes or politicians. They trust in God and God alone to uphold their life. And if God is the sole object of our faith, then he alone gets to dictate and determine how we live. Daniel was guilty of violating the king's injunction. And for that reason, he had to be thrown into the lion's den. But Daniel's disobedience was not a slight to the king. It was the logical outworking of his faith in God. Look at what it says in, in verse 22. He says, I was blameless before God, and before you, O king, I have done no harm. Was Daniel loyal to the king? Yes, he certainly was. But his greater allegiance was to his God. Daniel would not sin against the king. He wouldn't violate the king's trust with theft or deceit. He would work hard for it. He would honor the king. He would do nothing to harm the king in any way. And he would do everything in his power to serve the king well. But when push came to shove, the king was not the one that got to dictate Daniel's life and practice. God was. So when the king commanded Daniel to stop worshiping his God, there was no hesitation. There was no question for Daniel. That was not even on the table. And this is what our relationship with the authorities in our lives should look like. We honor and obey them because God has given them that authority. The ones we like, the ones we don't like. The great bosses, the angry bosses that annoy us. Students, this applies to your relationship with your parents. When you think they're being reasonable and cool and when you think they're being unreasonable and annoying, your responsibility is to respect them and honor them and be obedient to them. And the only exception is when those authorities ask us to be disobedient to the Lord. When I first read through this passage, I found it a little odd that the other officials were thrown into the lion's den. Because after all, even though he was right to do so, Daniel did break the king's law. These men did not lie about Daniel's disobedience. So I was wondering, why did the king punish them? And that the reason is, is I think that they still were on, they were still dishonest with the king. There's a lot of overlap here in the language used by and about the officials in this chapter uh, compared to the wise men in chapter three who accused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in chapter three, those wise men, they accused Daniel's friends of paying no attention to the king. They framed them as these arrogant, rebellious, treasonous men. The same exact phrase used to describe the accusation against those Three friends, it's the same language used to describe the accusations against Daniel. And I think Daniel's overlapping this language intentionally because he's telling us that the officials essentially tried to do the same thing that the wise men did to his friends. They wanted to make the king believe Daniel was rebellious. They wanted him to believe that Daniel intended him harm, wanted to undermine the king. It's funny, it's a whole new kingdom, a whole new regime but the persecution Daniel faces is exactly the same. Only here, the king doesn't buy it. And he, he's not having any of it. And without the panic brought on by the potential of Daniel's execution, he can see through the ruse of these officials. So Daniel may have violated the king's command here, but he did no harm to the king. He did not seek to undermine him in any way. And while the officials hadn't broken the law, they were the ones truly guilty of seeking to harm the king. And their punishment is one of the harshest that we see in Scripture. But it is important for us to remember that just because the Bible records an action does not mean that God approves of that action. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy would explicitly disapprove of this sentence. It tells us that, that family members are not to be punished for the sins of their family members. But this was the law of the Persians. And the lions, who were apparently starving after that night, uh, they... they tore men, women, and children to shreds before they even hit the ground. In the aftermath of these events, 
Darius issues a decree very similar to the one Nebuchadnezzar issued in chapter 4. And he calls for all people to respect and fear God, or Daniel's God. And then he praises Daniel's God for the miracles and the, the work that he has done. Now, I don't know if Darius was faithful. He actually truly converted here. We don't know. We don't know enough about him. But he sends out a very similar injunction, very similar decree that Nebuchadnezzar sent out just before his conversion. And with that, chapter 6 finally comes to an end with this final note in verse 28. Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Persian. Now that may seem to work against my theory that they're the same person, uh, but this could also be translated as during the reign of Darius, namely the reign of Cyrus the Persian. They're kept separate in most English translations just to reflect the fact that we can't really be 100% sure. So Daniel came to Babylon as a teenager, kidnapped, taken from his family and friends and everything he had known. He faced unbelievable trial and pressure to conform to a sinful culture and world around him. But he was steadfast. He resolved himself to be faithful no matter the consequences. And here in chapter 6, we see in practice what steadfast faith looks like. And it provides a powerful example for Christians today. Steadfast faith is consistently demonstrated through obedience and allegiance to Christ alone. That's our big idea from chapter 6. Steadfast faith is consistently demonstrated through obedience and allegiance to Christ alone. Our love for Jesus should not be hidden. It shouldn't be a secret. If we truly love and obey Jesus, our life is going to look different than the world around us. And Daniel was known for his obedience to his God. When people think of Redemption Bible Church, they may dislike us for the fact that we are Christians. It may annoy them that we follow Jesus, that we take God's word seriously. But at the same time, they should know that, man, we love the people in our community, that we are serious about being generous and kind and loving. We're, we're serious about serving others, about being humble. That's why we do things like Winterfest that we did this past week, and we had 20 of us standing out there in the cold for four hours yesterday just to serve, just to meet people and be kind and invite them to church and talk about Jesus. It was great. The men who sought to destroy Daniel, they had to acknowledge that he was blameless, that he did things with excellence. They hated him, but not because he did anything wrong. It was for his faith. And if we are to be hated by the world, let us make sure that they also have to acknowledge that we are blameless, that we're a blessing to the community around us. As Christians, we should be known as the most dependable and hardworking employees. We should do our jobs with excellence because we do them chiefly for the glory of God. Our friends should know that we will not compromise where God has spoken and commanded. And they may think we're a little strange for it because we refuse to speak and act in the same way as them, that's okay. And at the same time, despite our strangeness and them thinking us were a, a little bit weird, they should know us as the most generous, the most selfless kind of friend because we're imitating the selflessness and the generosity of Jesus Christ. Steadfast faith, like the faith of Daniel, will always manifest itself in consistent and ongoing obedience. Those whose faith are truly steadfast, they are not driven by peer pressure or the shifting trends and ideologies of the culture. The ones who have steadfast faith, they're unfazed when the world hates them or finds them strange because their allegiance does not belong to the world in the first place. Their allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ and him alone. Let's close our time by asking the Lord to help us as we strive to demonstrate the same kind of of steadfast faith. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word, that your word is living and active and that it changes us and that it is so relevant to us today, 2,000 years later. And God, we thank you for the example of Daniel who has showed us what steadfast faith looks like. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us 
that we would follow the leading and convicting of your spirit as we seek to be obedient to you every day. Help us to develop consistency in our worship and in our faith. Lord, help us to avoid being driven and blown around by the changing ideologies and the changing climate of the culture around us. Lord, I pray that we would be known as a blessing to those around us despite the fact that they may disagree with our faith. Lord, let our greatest allegiance be to you and you alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.